Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Ian Oswald, and I'm going to be talking on skinny pandas riding on a rocket uh, aimed at making your data science workflows go faster. So today's goal, well, many of you will be working on pandas. So we're going to look at getting more into RAM so that we can have more data in pandas before using other tools, figuring out why some of this is slow and figuring out ways to make it go faster. When we need to go beyond pandas, then we'll look at a couple of new tools. So Dask, which will let us work on larger data sets uh, and work in a multi-core scenario. We'll look briefly at SQLite, which I think is an under-recognized and underutilized tool for SQL collaboration, uh, which enables uh, very large files. Uh, and then we'll finish off by looking at Vakes, uh, a new competitor uh, against uh, Pandas and Dask, um, which I think enables uh, new workflows, uh, which could be really interesting to some of you, particularly if you're working on very large data sets uh, or you're a bit frustrated by Pandas being slow and you're working on one machine. Uh, to do all of this, we'll be looking uh, at the uh, UK land registry data sets, so that's house purchases and house prices, uh, it's 25 million rows. So introductions, uh, my name is Ian Oswald, I'm an interim chief data scientist, so I go into companies, many of the big brands that you'll recognise, and many smaller companies as well, and help them uh, when when they could do with finding out uh, all the mistakes that someone who's been doing this for 20 years may have made so that they don't have to make those same mistakes for themselves. Uh, making new mistakes is fun, repeating the old mistakes kind of boring. Uh, so I go and help teams with strategic planning and also going to write intellectual property so that teams write the right code and get their products delivered. So I've been doing this for two decades, uh, a lot of the time in the uh, Python ecosystem. Uh, and in the last several years, I've been working more on building up uh, public courses, particularly one around high performance computing. The first time I presented this actually was at EuroPython in 2011. That turned into my high performance Python book co-written with Misha Gorlick. You can see a, a screenshot of the cover on the right hand side. Uh, and earlier this year, we published the second edition of that. And look at that. It's over 400 pages of meaty goodness about high performance computing all in Python. Uh, and uh, some of the material that I'll be covering in this uh, this talk today comes from my course uh, and a uh, little bit from the book. I'm also one of the co-founders of the PyData London Meetup. Um, we've got over 180 groups around the world. Uh, you probably know something about PyData, given that you're attending PyData Global. Welcome along. Um, I'm super proud of the fact that PyData London is one of the largest, I think still the largest uh, of the meetups uh, on the planet. Um, and uh, you're super welcome to come and join our community wherever you are in the world. Uh, on that note, um, I've been volunteering with uh, PyData for over seven years. We've run an annual conference that's turned into PyData Global this year. It keeps raising money for the open source community. I'm sure you'll be hearing about that during the course of the conference. Remember that all of us presenting and all of the organizers are volunteers. We're volunteering our time to make the open source world better. So as and when you meet people online, particularly the authors whose talks you like uh, and the other volunteer organizers, say thank you, make the world a better place and go and say thank you. Uh, I'll give you a little caveat. Uh, we're dealing with some benchmarking in this talk. And of course, all benchmarks are wrong. In fact, benchmarks typically are lies and they can distort the truth. So I've tried to make sure that none of the points I raise here are completely comparable. Um, because I think that will be an unfair comparison. I'm not trying to set out to show that one library is better than another. I'm just trying to show some of the differences and strengths of some of the libraries here. Your libraries, your operating system, uh, the versions of tools that you've got and your data uh, will change the results from what we see here. So of course you need to do your own experiments. Don't take anything here as being the golden truth. Take it as a guide to help uh, guide you on the decisions you want to make. So. We'll start with pandas. So pandas, uh, a little bit of background. Uh, well, pandas, uh, it's a venerable tool. It's been around for a while. It grew out of NumPy. Uh, I think the first release uh, noted on the right, taken from Wikipedia, was around 2008. So it's 12 years old. So many design decisions have been taken over the course of that time from when pandas and Python um, was much younger in the data science game. And now, over a decade later, we're in a bit of a different world. Uh, back then, it made sense to load all of the data into RAM. So Pandas represents everything in RAM. So you have to have enough RAM uh, in your machine to represent it. Uh, and operations can be quite expensive, creating temporaries. Um, and it's not unusual to realize that uh, even uh, with an initial data set, you need several times uh, the RAM available to do any operations for temporaries whilst you're working on your data set, which means you need quite a lot of RAM, even for relatively small data sets now. 
It's got a very rich API. It's pretty wide as well, so you can do lots of things, time series resampling, text-based analytics. You can handle all sorts of data types. You can join and merge like an SQL database. You can do a lot of things in there, uh, which means it's complicated. There's lots of time series tooling, which uh, is important to a lot of people. Um, it's a well-respected project. It's got a lot of uh, followers on GitHub. It's got a lot of contributions. It's got a lot of issues filed, a lot of forks. It's got a, a lot of popularity behind it and a lot of core contributors. Let's have a brief look at some of the data that we'll be using in here for some of these comparisons. So this is a, a tiny snippet from the UK land registry data set. It's an open data, data set. 25 million rows with lots of text columns and also numbers and dates, uh, which represent uh, when the house prices, uh, when the sale of a house uh, uh, was completed. And so we get details about it, including the price, the location, um, uh, and uh, the date. Uh, and so it's a, it's a pretty good mixed, uh, interesting data set showing real world trends. We'll summarize some of those trends. Um, the original data set was four gigabytes of CSV. That takes a good few minutes to load into Pandas. I saved it out as a pickled file. That's very quick. It takes seconds to export that and import it in. But even then, representing this data in memory costs 10 gigabytes, even though the file itself is four gigabytes. And that's because Pandas isn't great at representing string columns in particular in RAM. They get very expensive on RAM. So can we do anything about that? And of course, yes, we can. Uh, we'll be using a thinner slice of this data set uh, for some of the early slides. So here I've made DF few coals, so DF fewer columns, uh, using the county column, that's the location, PT, that's property type, um, D is detached house, F is flat, S is semi-detached, these are property types in the UK. Date is when the transaction was completed and price is the price of the house. And look at that, back in 1995, you could buy a house for £18,000. Oh, that's so quaint. Uh, now you're looking at half a million to a million to purchase things, certainly around uh, the London uh, and uh, lots of the more popular places in the UK, uh, how inflation has changed the game. So first of all, let's say uh, you've loaded a data set, you're beginning to do some operations, you're discovering that you run out of RAM every now and again, or things are really slow and you're scratching your head, you're trying to wonder why that might be. So you use uh, the dot .info function, which tells us about the, uh, the size of the data set, uh, the columns, the data types behind the columns. You can see on the left-hand side, dfucoles.info. It says we've got 25 million items in our range index. Great, so we've got 25 million rows. Uh, we've got a, a county, a PT, a date, and a price, two object columns, a date time 64, and an int 64. Well, the date time 64, that's an eight byte object, and in 64, that's an eight byte object. So we know exactly how big that is. Eight bytes times 25 billion rows, we can calculate the memory head for that. The objects, on the other hand, we can't trivially find out how expensive they are in terms of RAM. And so Pandas reports, well, 777 plus megabytes. It's an estimate. That plus means it's an estimate. It's an underestimate. If we use dfucoles.info memory usage equals deep, which you can see on the right-hand side, you'll see the true memory usage is 3.4 gigabytes. What's happening here is Pandas goes through every row for every item in that column and says, exactly how big are you? You each individual string one at a time. Counts up the individual cost. It takes a good few seconds, and that gives us the true estimate back. So what's a true uh, measure of RAM usage rather than the underestimate that we started with? 3.4 gigabytes just to get the data into memory before we do anything else at all. Um, just for this thin data set, this is not the wider data set that I started with, of course, that was 10 gigabytes. So what can we do about that? Well, uh, Pandas introduced the categorical data types and historically we've had other thinner representations of our data with uh, numeric columns. So let's use two of those. So uh, I'm going to make a DF slimmer coals, so a slimmer set of columns. I'm going to take my DF coals county and turn it into as type category. I do the same for PT and for date. Uh, for price, I'm not turning that into a category. I'm turning that into an int 32. It started out life as an int 64. So it started with eight bytes. If I go into an int 32, it goes down to four bytes. For the other three uh, items there, uh, county, PT, and date, we're turning them into categoricals. You can access all of the same operations underneath. So with a categorical date, you can still do .dt, uh, .year, for example, to get out the year. But as we'll see, it uses a uh, much less RAM. So by creating this DF slimmer coals, and if I do, uh, I call it the memory usage, I can see now the memory usage is 219 megabytes. So contrast that with 3.4 gigabytes that we had a moment ago. And that's because of the categorical encoding. 
all of the strings, rather than being repeated redundantly many times, because the counties, there's only a fixed small number of counties in the UK, rather than repeating those redundantly, uh, the unique strings are taken out and an integer encoding is put in place there. And the smallest integer encoding that could be used, maybe an int8 or an int16 is used behind the scenes. So a categorical encoding is kind of a compression uh, uh, measure. And actually, it makes things faster, not slower. Well, if we're dealing with strings, uh, that's particularly true. You see on the right-hand side, uh, DFU or Cole's PT value count, so the original data, takes 1.96 seconds, nearly two seconds. When I do it on DF slimmer Cole's, so the categorical data type, it's 146 milliseconds. So it's over 10 times faster. That's because rather than counting strings, we're counting numbers and then just representing them as strings at the end. So how many sales uh, do we actually see over the course of, uh, of the, the, the years? Uh, here, if I just do a group buy on year and PT, that's property type, we can see that prior to the Great Recession, so prior to 2007, property sales are increasing, then they all decline, and then they begin to increase. 2020 is a partial year, of course, so don't worry too much about that decline in sales that you can see there. Really look up to 2019 so we can see that sales have recovered somewhat. What does that group by cost us? Well, we're going to have to look into that with a memory profiler. So the memory profiler package is a really interesting package. It lets us dig into the memory usage in a Python process. You can look at individual lines of memory cost inside your module. You can track a whole program's execution with mprof. That small diagram on the right, we'll see a larger version later. And you can track the usage of a single command with percent memit. So if we use percent memit on our group by, df group by year, where we take the size of that grouping, we can see that it costs 388 megabytes. On the right-hand side, you can see that the shape of that final result is 26 items. So it feels kind of expensive just to summarize something down to uh, 26 items. Um, if I do a group by on year and PT property type, that costs nearly a gigabyte, 929 megabytes. And if I do it on three items, year, PT, and new, it costs 1.1 gigabytes. So that's really quite a lot that's going on in the background, even though that the unique result out of that is 247 items. Now, you might wonder if using the categorical version saves us RAM and makes this faster. Sadly, it doesn't have much of an effect on the group by. Uh, so it gives us more RAM to play with for representing the data, but it doesn't make the group by operation go much faster. For that, actually, we have to go to some other tooling. Uh, you can see here that the peak memory is now up to 13 gigabytes. I started with 10 gigabytes uh, just by adding in. Uh, a couple of group buys and receiving some operations. So my RAM is growing quite a lot. Uh, I've actually opened a ticket on the Pandas website, uh, surprisingly large memory usage and group buy. Uh, you might be interested in having a look at that to uh, see if you can learn something as that discussion moves forwards. Now, there's a, a tool that I've written which extends the memory profile called the IPython memory usage. It's kind of an auto percent memit. At the top, you can see the result of percent memit on a group buy of three items. It tells us we incremented by 1.1 gigabytes. If we use IPython memory usage, every time you run a cell in your Jupyter notebook or your IPython shell, it does that memory in the background. And so it reports how long the operation took and what the peak memory usage was whilst it ran and what the current RAM usage is. You may find that a useful tool. If you want your operations to go faster, then there's a couple of uh, numeric tools that you might introduce. One is bottleneck. This gives us free speed ups on math in pandas, and it doesn't get installed by default. You have to install it by hand. I'm always checking whenever I make a new environment, do I have bottleneck? Oh no, I don't, I better go and install it. If I use pd.options.compute.useBottleneck false, which turns off bottleneck, so I've got it installed and I'm disabling it. I take a float 64 column, I've turned price into a float 64. So I've got a float 64 floating point number. I take the mean 137 milliseconds. If I then turn bottleneck's use back on, and it's on by default if you've got it installed. But here I've turned it off, so I turn it back on again. Now that same operation costs 55 milliseconds. So that's uh, two to three times speed up just by in, uh, installing a free library that has no downsides. So install bottleneck and also uh, install numexpr. That can make some of your queries and eval operations go faster. If you know that you've got numeric data, and that you're using NumPy in the background. It's a bit more of an advanced tip here. If you know that you're using NumPy's representation, so lowercase in 64, lowercase float 64, you can use, uh, you can drop down to the NumPy representations and use the NumPy functions. If you know that you don't have NAND data in your column, so no, not a numbers, you can call to NumPy, 
take the mean, 16 milliseconds, as opposed to taking the original price F64 column, taking the mean in pandas, 55 milliseconds with bottleneck. That's because the pandas version is checking for NANDs, so checking for not a numbers, which uh, might distort the results. The NumPy version of mean there isn't doing that check, so it goes faster. So it's a bit more of an advanced tip. I've got uh, more on that in my PyData Amsterdam 2020 talk, which is on my blog if you're interested. So here's a couple of tips. Use categoricals uh, for speeding up uh, your operations and also to save RAM. It doesn't work across the board, but generally they just work and they just give you a free speed up, but certainly they free, uh, free up a bunch of RAM so you can get more data into RAM. If possible, go from the default float 64 and int uh, 64 columns down to int 32 and float 32. Your operations may perform faster. Floats certainly tend to go a bit faster with float 32, but they'll use half the RAM and that will let you get more data into RAM before you're using other tools. Install uh, Bottleneck and Numexpra. They just pip installs away. Uh, they give you free speed ups in Pandas. Uh, but also be aware that we can only take this so far. To scale, we really need to go for some newer tools. So what about Dask? So Dask is a rich library. Li uh, Dask is a rich library wrapping uh, data frames and arrays and arbitrary Python functions. So you can wrap up. Uh, pandas data frame like operations, NumPy array like operations, or just regular Pythonic code with no scientific work in the background at all. It's actually a very powerful and quite complex uh, tool. Um, most people know that it's there for speeding up pandas data frames. Uh, it actually wraps up pandas data frames. It doesn't re-implement them. It actually provides a wrapper around a regular pandas data frame. So you chunk up your uh, your data, your large data frame into small chunks of data frames, and each of those become a Dask distributed data frame. You can see in the diagram, we've got a set of collections, we've got arrays, that's the NumPy array for larger than RAM arrays, the data frame for Pandas data frames, bags, the latest futures. There's even a machine learning component. Behind the scenes, we get a task graph of decomposed tasks, and then these can be run on different types of schedule. There's a single machine or a distributed scheduler. But it's a very rich and complex ecosystem. It's not just about data frames. That's the, one of the take homes. Dask is not just about data frames. When would you use it? Well. If you've got data that's bigger than RAM, of course, you need to use something like this to be able to process your data. If you want to use all of your cores, so you have CPU-bound functions operating on your data frames, or you're doing NumPy array work, which is CPU-bound, then Dask is a brilliant idea. If your data fits into RAM, but you find that some of your operations cause it to run out of RAM and you can't just compress using the techniques we used earlier, then maybe Dask will give you a solution as well. Generally, behind the scenes, you'll be using Parquet data files. So these are columnar data uh, data files where we store uh, snippets of our data, so blocks of our pandas data in, in row blocks uh, by columns, where each column can be compressed. And we can load in columns independently, reducing the amount of data that we load. Uh, Dask works with CSV files and with lots of other numeric formats, but Parquet is kind of where the sweet spot is most of the time. There are dashboards uh, inside Dask that give us rich diagnostics. You can see one of the task stream diagnostics on the right-hand side, and it lets you write pandas-like code. The evaluation is lazy, so you have to add dot .compute onto the end of your chained computations before anything gets calculated. Otherwise, you're writing code, you think you've written pandas-like code, you get no result, and you're wondering what's happened. You put dot .compute on the end, and you get your result. So let's uh, let's take a common uh, pandas operation. So taking a time series and resampling it. Here I've already prepared my data. I've read in my CSV file with Dask, and I've written out a hundred parquet partitions. You can do that in a couple of lines uh, in Dask very easily. So I've written out my data. I've compressed it with the Snappy Compressor. That's one of the tools that's used by default in Parquet. Uh, and you can see on the right-hand side my uh, a little snapshot of my Parquet uh, folder. Actually, these files are 20 megabytes each. They're probably too small. Typically, with Parquet, we might use 100 megabyte files. The 20 megabyte files means that uh, each time I load one of those uh, chunks of data into memory, I don't use a lot of RAM. On the left-hand side, you can see that I've specified two columns, date and PT, the property type that I put into my read parquet function. This means read parquet only reads in two columns rather than the 15 or so columns that exist. So there's less data to bring up from the disk and bring into RAM. You can see a little representation of that in the bottom left-hand corner. Uh, at the bottom right-hand side, you can see my DDF query. So a DDF is a distributed data frame. Uh, that's the uh, Dask distributed variant of a data frame. 
I give it a query. That's just a regular uh, pandas query. Give me uh, all the items in a certain date range. Set the index the date. That's like the set index uh, inside pandas. That's actually quite slow when you're doing it uh, on lots of partial files. These are 100 parquet files that are written out. And then having set the index, I would like to do a resample to weekly from daily data. And I want to count the results. And then I dot compute. And that gives me my weekly completions, the, the sum of number of houses are actually sold per week. That costs nine seconds. So you can see it's pretty easy to put together. It looks like regular pandas. And I get access to all of the underlying pandas functionality like uh, daytime resampling, which is brilliant. That's one of the powerful areas uh, of pandas. Now, what's happening in the background? Well, we can use the memory profiler again in a different way with the mprof tool. This we use at the command line. You can see at the bottom of the screen there, mprof run, uh, track multi-process and uh, include the children. Desk spawns out children, child processes. If you only include the parent process, you'd only see a, a tiny snapshot of the RAM being used. You wouldn't see the workers in the background. Here we can see the workers as well. So. Uh, the uh, the green and the red line that are bobbling at around 200 to 400 megabytes, that's the two children processes that I've spawned off, reading in a parquet file, doing a bit of work, uh, doing a group by in this case, and then dropping that parquet file and reading in the next one and repeating and repeating and repeating until they've done all of their partial pieces of work and they communicate the result back. The black line at the top is the aggregate RAM usage for all of the children processes. And we can see that in total, this desk operation is costing 1.2 gigabyte way less than the 10 gigabyte that we had with the pandas version earlier on. So this takes two processes, uh, 1.2 gigabytes. Um, and in fairness here, I'm actually loading in all of the data rather than just a couple of columns just to try to amplify the memory usage. The actual memory usage, if you optimize how you write this code, is much less in this particular case. If I change this and go for 16 processes, then we can see now I'm up to six gigabytes of total RAM usage. And rather than being 45 seconds to execute, I'm down to about 25 seconds. Uh, so it's still, it's, it's not super quick, um, but it's still pretty quick. It's not as quick as it could be because I'm loading in too much data and I could further optimize this and simplify the process, um, which is one of the nice things uh, with Dask. I've got uh, a lot of control over what I read in and what I process and what I do with it. But the take home here is at the beginning, we started with pandas with 10 gigabytes plus before we did any operations. Now doing the same operations on the same data, I'm maxing out at six gigabytes uh, and uh, getting a pretty good uh, speed uh, out of my operation. On the right hand side, you can see the task list uh, from the desk dashboard for this particular operation. Uh, because here I've asked, well, in two years, how many completions do I get resampled to a weekly basis? You know, hey, there'll be some time series dynamics behind this. Well, it turns out over those two years, we can see an interesting trend. Every year, sales start lower in the year, and then over the course of the year, they get higher. Then at Christmas, they drop back, and then they start climbing again. And so we see this kind of strange sort of tooth pattern going on over the course of each year. You could imagine having not 25 billion records, but hundreds of millions of records, and the same process would work with the same RAM footprint. It would just take longer to execute. So here's some desk tips. You want to keep it simple. And I promise you, you really want to keep it simple when you start out. There's lots of moving parts. The documentation is very good. A couple of years ago, the docs weren't so good. Now the docs are very good. But you do want to keep it simple. It's easy to start running before you can walk, trip up, and then you hurt yourself and you cry because it's not obvious what's going on because there are many moving parts in desk. Start with fewer processes. You can control this when you make up a local cluster. Fewer processes with lots of RAM in there, and then reduce the RAM and increase the number of processes uh, and change your parquet partition sizes when you get an idea as to how your competition, computation is performing. Always remember to call dot .compute. If possible, take your distributed data frame and call sample and ask for, say, 1% of the data. This means only 1% is flowing through the entire process. So rather than waiting 30 seconds for a result, you might wait just a couple of seconds. You can interactively debug a heck of a lot easier that way. And remember that Dask is not just about data frames. It also wraps up distributed arrays for NumPy-like operations, a bag, which is a, um, it's kind of a combination of a set and a list in pure Python, delayed functions, and lots more. So SQLite uh, is an underused and I think underrated tool. SQLite is a single file SQL database solution. It's not specific to Python. It's been around for 20 years. It's got over 2 million tests. It's arguably the most widely deployed database on the planet because it's plumbed into Android and Java and Python and Firefox and Chrome. It's just baked into a whole bunch of tools because it's really good. 
when you ask someone, hey, would you consider using, say, SQLite rather than Postgres? They may well say, well, no, it's a toy database. You can't really do very much with it. Well, that's kind of true. You know, you can only store 281 terabytes of data into one of these databases. Uh, it's not designed for scaling. It's not designed for heavy write volumes or multi-user write access. Really, it's designed for uh, read, uh, read heavy access patterns, light writing, and single user access or multi-user um, without multi-user writes. So there are limitations around it, but it comes as a single 700 kilobyte executable, uh, and it has a very small RAM footprint. So we can do things like use SQL Alchemy to bind a connection to a local on-disk uh, SQLite database. We can export from Pandas to this SQL, so I can write out my Pandas data frame into SQLite, and I get a four gigabyte file. And then I can run a query, select county and uh, count star uh, from this table, grouping by county, I wait two seconds because I put an index onto uh, the county table, and then I get my data frame back. When I do my read SQL, I get a data frame. I can do a set index because it's a data frame, and it just works. So if you're collaborating with other users who are more SQL friendly, or you want a single file of data that you could source control with a well-understood binary format, so no messing around with CSV files, which are hard to interpret, and different tools interpret them differently do consider using an SQLite database. Uh, and uh, it's underappreciated that typically it's fast enough for many applications and for multiple users to use at a time, and it can read gigabytes and terabytes worth of data. So what about Vakes? This is a newer data frame system. So it's, uh, it's a lesser known pandas alternative. It's designed to handle billions of rows, and probably they're stored in a single HDF5 file on your hard drive. So really, it's designed for local computation on one large file on one large hard drive. So unlike Dask, which can scale to multiple machines uh, and multiple files, uh, uh, Vex is designed really to work on uh, on this uh, single file on one machine. But hey, that gets us way beyond the limitations of pandas on our one machine, and we can rent very big machines. It uses memory mapping, so it keeps RAM usage low and keeps on paging its operations onto the disk, just like SQLite is doing in the background, using very sensible technologies that are well understood. Um, it enables efficient group buys. It's got faster string handling than we have in Pandas. I've actually seen 10 times faster string operations uh, with Vakes, uh, with its uh, data stored on disk than I have with Pandas in RAM, uh, because they've uh, rewritten uh, the string operations in C++. Uh, it's NumPy focused for its data types, so it doesn't have the Pandas extension times. It has the underlying NumPy data types that we used to. And it also has uh, frameworks for machine learning and for visualizing large data sets, uh, which is uh, really a very interesting addition, I think. Uh, and it uses a lazy expression system that's similar, not the same as Dasks, but similar to Dasks. It does have fewer users uh, and fewer you know, smaller activity on GitHub. The core developers are very focused, but it's a younger, smaller project. Um, so uh, go there, remembering that it's not Pandas and it's not Dask. Uh, it's something that's very similar um, with different performance characteristics. So typically, we convert our data from a CSV file to HDF5 files. That's pretty easy. There's a couple of built-in functions to do it. It took me five minutes. Once you've converted it, opening the file is instant. It uses memory mapping, so there's nothing to read when you open it. And then you run queries, and they run in the background, multi-core. It actually just works. It's, it, I found it actually a bit easier to get started once I got my head around it uh, with Vakes than with, uh, with Dask uh, for a, a single large file on one machine. And the results that you get look like Pandas data frames. The operations look like Pandas operations, but they're not. So you can see at the top here on the left-hand side, I've opened a VDF. I've called it a VDF just to differentiate it from the DDF from Dask and the DF from Pandas. So the VDF is a Vakes DF here, here in my example. I've opened a file. I just give it a file name. It opens up the HDF5 file that we created before. You can see that I pull out the day of week from VDF.date. We've got the familiar DT accessor. And then I do a group by on day of week. And here you pass in the aggregation as an argument. So it looks like pandas, but it's not quite the same way the pandas does it. Uh, and then I sort the item that comes out the other side. If I ask for its type, I'm told that it's a data frame arrays object. So it's clearly not a pandas, uh, a pandas data frame. I can convert this to a pandas data frame. Vakes allows that. Um, but here I've got the Vakes, uh, Vakes version of their data frames. On the right-hand side, we can see the output of that. So what does it mean to have uh, completions counted by day of week? Well, it turns out in the UK housing market, most of the time when you actually complete and buy a house, it's meant to occur during the work, working week, any time during the working week. Typically, it works out that it completes on a Friday. Everything gets pushed to the Friday in the hope that you can move on a Saturday. And you can see there's even a couple of completions that happen on Saturdays and Sundays for those unlucky few. Uh, it's a strange distortion and dynamic in the UK market. 
Bottom right corner, I've done a percent time on the VDF group buy on day of week, and it took uh, under one and a half seconds to do that operation. It's one and a half seconds. And the thing to remember is if I use MPROF to look at the RAM usage of the operation and any of these operations, rather than loading in 10 gigabytes worth of data, or as we saw with Desk, um, several gigabytes uh, through to say 20, 30 gigabytes, here the operations typically are pinned under a gigabyte in RAM. So its RAM usage is much lower, not as low as SQLite, that tends to stick at around 90 megabytes, so hardly anything at all, trading off uh, less speed for lower RAM usage. Here, Vakes trades off uh, trades off some speed uh, and has more data in RAM. And that's kind of like the, the size of the group by that I had in Pandas originally, but just the Pandas uh, group by operation, not all of the data stored into RAM originally. Here, all that data doesn't end up stored in RAM because it's kept on disk. Uh, so a bunch of these operations that you'd normally do in Pandas when they're in RAM actually occur at a similar speed, if not faster. So string operations are much faster with fakes than they are currently in Pandas, uh, which I think is really interesting. So when might you use these? Well, Dask is multi-core and multi-machine and multi-file friendly. Vakes tends to work with uh, multi-core on a single machine, typically with a single file. Dask allows most of pandas and supports uh, huge NumPy arrays and bags and others. Um, both can handle billions of rows and they can do machine learning and both have readable code. So if you have to go and diagnose the code, both have very readable code. So in summary, well, you can make your data in pandas smaller and you can make your operations faster, but at some point you run out of RAM still. Then maybe if you want the core pandas functionality and that's what you're most used to, maybe you want to stick with Dask because that gives you access to all of the pandas underlying features. If you're working with NumPy data types and so not the pandas extension types and you're working less with time series operations, then I think uh, Vakes might be a very interesting alternative because um, it enables you to write arbitrary Python code, which is run across these very large data frames up to billions of rows very happily. Uh, I've got loads of public material from a sequence of talks that I've been giving over the last year uh, and actually over the last bunch of years up on my blog. You're very welcome to go and look at those. Uh, and I've got a course based around this uh, this high performance computing details will be on my blog every now and again. Uh, I've written a book on this, as I mentioned at the beginning. That's my high performance book. Uh, it's, uh, it's got over 400 pages of this stuff. So if you want to learn more about this high performance area, grab a copy of that book. I'd love to sign it if I see you at a conference in the future. And if you look over my shoulder, you can see postcards up on the wall uh, when I give conference conference talks now, I ask, hey, if I've taught you something, please send me a postcard. I love collecting postcards from around the world. So if you'd like to send me a postcard, send me an email. I would love to receive one. I'd love to know what it was that you found most useful. So uh, remember to say thank you to your organizers and the other presenters around at the conference. Uh, and uh, well, uh, I look forward to meeting you online during the Q&A. Thanks for watching.